All right, so uh, last talk uh, for this session is correcting noise in optical fibers via dynamical decoupling, given by Catherine Brown. Okay, thank you very much for the conference organizers for letting me give a talk. Um, as you can tell from my accent, I've come from Louisiana, and I've got, <laughs> I'm going to give a talk done along with our PhD students, Bosca and Manish, our former postdoc, Peter, who's now at Stony Brook in New York, um, Cody, and our two professors, Huang Li and Jonathan Dowling, and I'm going to be talking about correcting um, for depolarization of, of a photon in an optical fiber. Um, we've done, um, our work is simulations rather than analytical. So I'll be begin with an introduction. I'll then introduce um, dynamical decoupling again. I know you've had several introductions this week, but one more can't hurt. I'll then introduce the CPMG, the one we're using, um, finally show our results and then some conclusions. Um, so dynamical decoupling is um, a, sam a type of open loop quantum error correction. It's not going to replace the closed loop error correction protocols that we've been discussing a lot today, such as surface codes, but the hope is to introduce it um, before we perform these operations to get the errors down to a suitable level for threshold because at the moment most of um, the errors sent in transportation and moving gates are far too high for threshold level and we can't even begin thinking about performing the quantum error correction codes. There are several forms of this open loop quantum error correction. Um, dynamical decoupling is one example and the other one which I think you'll hear about is decoherence free subspaces. Um, so this has been quite a lot of previous work done on using dynamical decoupling to correct for errors photons. Um, Wu and Lidar did um, some key work on proving that you could use um, dynamical decoupling to correct for um, dephasing in optical fibers. That was some analytical work driving worst case scenarios using a um, regularly pulsed scheme. Um, other work has looked at correcting or mode dispersion in optical fibers. And interestingly, experimentally, there's been work done looking um, at photons in ring cavities. So it's a different scenario to the optical fibers, but that's actually demonstrated the effects of, or the effectiveness of dynamical decoupling for photons. Um, so we're going to consider sending a photon through an optical fiber. There's um, two particular reasons you might want to do this. One would be for distributed quantum computing. And in that case, you're wanting to send uh, general state in the HV basis. Um, the other reason may be for quantum cryptography, and that's slightly simpler because you're going to send um, your 0, 1 and your plus minus states, so you don't necessarily have to correct for all states. And we're going to model our noise as being changes in the biorefringence of the fiber caused by changes in the environment of the fiber. And these changes are going to happen on the orders of tens of meters. Um, and because we're using a polarization maintaining fiber, we're only going to be correcting for depolarization in dephasing in one direction, and that's going to be our Z direction. So that's the standard model of noise that's been being used um, throughout most of these dynamic decoupling talks, although it's slightly simpler than the more general model. Um, so our dephasing can be seen as being a rotation around the Z axis of the block sphere. And as a result of this, we can see that the 0 and the 1 state are um, only acquire a global phase factor and therefore don't need any correction at all. They're perfect. But any other state um, will gain an error, which can be considered a rotation around the block sphere. Um, the simplest example of dynamic decoupling, again, as you've been all heard this week, is the spin, e spin echo. So we're going to introduce a slightly different diagram from the runners, which also gives an idea or intuitively of why this works. So in diagram A, we're considering letting our state evolve under the dephasing, and it evolves around the z-axis of our block sphere for a set amount of time, d. In diagram B, we then perform a pi pulse. This flips the qubit, as can be seen here, so it moves from this state to this state. In C, we allow it to um, continue rotating around the block sphere, so dephasing for the same amount of time as in diagram A. And this, begins, um, this continues to incorporate dephasing, but now our dephasing is moving our state back to its initial position. So it's beginning to actually correct our error. Finally, the last pi pulse 
um, brings us back to our initial state. Um, so different forms of dynamical decoupling are useful for different purposes. So we've all heard about the URIG dynamical decoupling being the optimal pulse separation. But that were, um, and we did some initial simulations on that, and we didn't get very positive results. Um, and the reason for that is because it works better when the noise has a sharp high frequency cutoff, which we don't have in our noise model. So instead, we moved on and looked at a CPMG sequence, um, car, my, my boom, per, car, Purcell, my boom, and gill. Um, instead of using regularly spaced pulses, we used a sequence where um, we're placing them along an optical fiber, so we're now going to go into distance instead of time. Our five first pi pulse is placed distance L into the fiber. The second pi pulse is a distance 2L. The third one a distance L. Fourth one another distance L, and then 2L again. And re repetitions of this sequence throughout the fiber. Um, one advantage of this sequence is it's supposed to be resistant to errors if we send through, uh, in the wave plate, if we send through a plus or minus state, um, and the reference for that is this paper by Morton. Um, it's, we haven't incorporated errors into our wave plates yet. That's something we hope to do in later work, and Dieter Suter gave us quite a good idea how to do that yesterday, so we're hoping to incorporate that in the next few months. Um, we... So we modeled our fiber um, here as regents of constant biorefringence given by delta N. Um, and delta N is a constant here, not the change in biorefringence. Um, for constant noise regions, delta L. And these delta L here, these one, two, three, four, five, we have more than five in our total model, are actually um, different lengths. So the idea is that it's, um, we have we set the mean of this distance and the standard deviation. So the idea is you've got your fiber and the, no the length of each region of constant biofringence is fluctuating and you don't actually know how long it is. Um, th so this is trying to get a more physical model. And the biorefringence here we set with some parameters. Um, we set it as zero mean and we set the standard deviations, as you'll see in our um, graphs. So a region of... Um, after us traveling a set region, we get accumulate this noise given here, and that's for one region. And then we run our simulations by sending a photon through several regions, generating this delta L and this delta N parameter at random, given our constraints each time. And we ran this for several hundred simulations and then plotted the graphs that we'll see. One key thing about our graphs is plotted the fidelity of the plus state. Um, we justify this by saying it's the worst um, fidelity possible given that we have no errors on our wave plate. And the reason can be seen for that is if we consider sending a single photon through our fiber with a collective dephasing of theta, which is the collective dephasing of all the noise regions, then we get um, the final state will take this form here. Um, when we have alpha equals beta, so when we have our plus state, then you just get cos squared theta, so this is the worst possible scenario. And in the best possible scenario, where we have alpha is one or beta is one, so our um, zero and one states, we get perfect fidelity every single time. And we're gonna move on to our results now. Um, so this is our first result, is um, how the number of wave plates affects our resultant fidelity. As we can see, as we increase the number of wave plates, unsurprisingly, the fidelity is of course, if we take into account uh, errors within the wave plates, then we'd actually expect this to level off and possibly go down further um, at the top. Um, here we've got a fiber of length 10 kilometers and a main noise region of 10 meters. The standard deviation in our noise region to so the variation in the noise region is three meters. And we can see, you can't probably read off the point, but to achieve 98% fidelity, we need 610 wave plates which would involve placing them roughly 8.2 meters apart. So that's a realistic distance apart to begin placing our wave plates. It's something we could actually consider doing. We'd be using passive wave plates. We've modeled it so far as X pulses, but obviously there are advantages to using a mixture of X pulses and Y pulses we found out um, yesterday. Oh, there we are. Um, and here we hold that we take 500 wave plates on a fiber length of and we can see um, how much dephasing we can correct for. 
So we see we've got this region here where we can correct for 98, um, we can correct up to 98%. So we begin thinking about using this region for quantum communication. We'd probably need to get some further improvements. And we've got this region here where we've got above 89%, which should be suitable for BB84. So hopefully for a reasonable error model in our fiber, we should be able to use um, wave plates and dynamical decoupling to correct for dephasing. And it's a brief talk, I'm afraid. So um, what we showed in our results is that we can use a CPMG sequence or dynamical decoupling to correct for dephasing and optical fibers. When we got a mean noise region of 10 meters, um, standard deviation in this of three meters, and a standard deviation in our biofringence of 100 radians for a 10 kilometer fiber, 610 wave plates are required to achieve a fidelity of 98%. And we're going to go on what happens if we introduce errors into these wave plates. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Thank you, that was crystal clear. And are there any questions? Just a clarification on the technology side. What do you mean when you say you put a wave plate in a fiber? Um, so that's something we've got, or we put several proposals in our paper on how to do that, but it's not going to necessarily be easy. I think there's some suggestions of using twists and other techniques, but I'd have to get back to you on the details. Could you give us some uh, further details on how you model the noise on the fiber? Um, so what happens is in each section of noise, In each section of noise, we generate a, ra a value for delta n between, um, with the standard deviations given by the ones on our graph and um, with the mean of zero. And we have that <coughs> delta n lasting for a length to L. So, so the noise is, is basically a fluctuation in the length of the fiber? Um, the noise is caused by fluctuations in the biorefringence um, along the length of the fiber. Okay. Coming back to the technology side, uh, you talked about only using passive wave plates, but there could be electro-optic modulators instead of uh, phase plates. And it would be a system very amenable towards um, what, dynamic feedback yes. to work out the optimal dynamical decoupling based on the, you know, the phase response of a polarized light going through that fiber. I'm wondering if this has a future direction in this. Uh. Um, I think it's a good idea. It's not something we've had a chance to look at yet, but I think it's something we want to move on to look at because we've certainly seen other papers on that work. Okay, any more questions? All right, if not, then thanks again. Uh, we have a 20-minute coffee break.